Do you gamble? If so, what sort of gambling do you like? Horse racing? Poker? How do you stand? Since you started betting or playing cards, I mean. Are you in or out? Well, I'll make a little bet. I'll bet you're out. I remember once in California, sitting at breakfast with half a dozen dollar millionaires many times over, and all of them betting and gambling men. I asked them if they thought they'd have been better off if they never made a bet or touched a card. Five of them said they were down, and the sixth said he'd lost plenty also, but added it was a lot of fun. Then someone grunted, fortunately you could afford it. That's right, he said. Fortunately I could afford it. The story I'm going to tell you today is about someone who could not afford it. In Scotland Yard, the case is known as the Liverpool Bank Fraud. Personally, I should prefer to call it the case of the perfect sap. But then so many of us gamble and so many of us lose and so many of us are saps that a few of us might take such a title a little personally. So we'll stick to the Liverpool Bank Fraud. <laughs> There's something always very dignified and slightly awe-inspiring about the atmosphere of the general manager's office of a large bank. And if ever you find yourself in one, to discuss your overdraft, for instance, your conversations apt to be carried on in the hushed tones you usually reserve for places like, well, let us say, St. Paul's Cathedral. That's the way it usually was, I've no doubt, in the manager's office of the Bank of Liverpool. But that's the way it certainly was not on this particular day on which our story begins the 21st of November, 1901. But the chief accountant had just brought to the general manager news which was, to put it mildly, of a somewhat disturbing character. A discrepancy of 160,000 pounds, you say? That's as near as I can calculate at the moment, sir. Maybe a little less, it may be a little more. It's unbelievable. How could anyone possibly get away with such a sum? Well, there must be some mistake. Oh, there's no mistake, sir. I've made a careful check of books. So much for our full proof accountancy system. So much for our auditors. There's going to be that deuce to pay over this. We'll be lucky if we don't lose our jobs. Oh, don't say that, sir. What would I tell my wife? Oh, the devil with your wife, man. What am I going to tell the board? This is going to be the biggest financial scandal in years. I, I don't suppose, sir, it could be hushed up. Of course it couldn't be hushed up. Don't talk like a fool. No, sir. What about young Harvey? Will you see him now? You're quite sure he's the one responsible. Oh, there's no doubt about it, sir. I can't understand it. Upon my word, I can't. I always thought he seemed a quiet, decent, honest young man. Hmm. How long has he been with us? Eight years. He began with only twenty first birthday. Hmm. He comes of respectable parents, haven't they? Oh, most respectable, sir. Scottish. Hmm. He's got to be a sad lord, his old mother. Oh, for heaven's sake, man, stop being sorry for other people. Be sorry for ourselves. Don't you realize how serious this is? Tell me, this, uh, this dowdy is you married? No, no, sir. He's not in the world dependent at all, I know. Does he drink? Does he keep bad company? No, sir. He's a very steady, sober young man. We've been paying him a decent salary, haven't we? Oh, that we have, sir. Last year it was raised to three pounds a week, no less. Three pounds a week. There's no prospect of further advancement and a pension on retirement. But on this soil, there aren't many young men so fortunate. What on earth possessed him to keep over the traces in this extraordinary way? I can't say as to that, sir. But I've already told you, I've not spoken to him yet. I thought it better not to let him know he'd been thrown out till you were in possession of all the facts. 
Shall I ask Dr. Wimper? Yes. Yes. I do hope he's not going to be too difficult. Hmm. Bones and deny that the repairs they only do, but we'll get to the truth of it sooner or later, never fear. And so Thomas Peterson Dowdy told the matter. As a matter of fact, he wasn't difficult about it at all. He'd been expecting this call for a long time, and he knew the game was up. So he admitted everything quite frankly. Perhaps a little too frankly for the taste of the manager. Aye, sir, the figures are right enough. 163,272 pounds, to be exact. I've kept a careful note of it all in this little book here. No, it can't. You understand what I can't do and tell me that you your shame, young man? I'll not say I'm proud of what I've done, sir, but you've asked me a straight question, so I've given you a straight answer. Well, uh, how long has this incredible business been going on? About three years. 160,000 pounds in three years? Why, well, that's more than a thousand pounds a week, sir. Do you realize what that means, Gowdy? All the publicity and disgrace of a trial. Imprisonment. Your, your career left. Your, your whole life here. I realize it only too well, sir. Yes. Well, you only one chance, young man. What's that? Return this money you've embezzled, and then perhaps the judge will take a more human view of it. I can't, sir. Why not? Because I've now got it. What's that you say? I've now got it, sir. It's all gone. Every penny. Nonsense. It's not possible for you to spend a thousand pounds week in and week out for three years. No, I have. It only did you wasn't a harm. Champagne parties, diamonds for actresses. Nothing as pleasurable as that. Well, what, what? On horse racing. But you, you, you've been buying race horses? No, sir. Betting on them and losing. Not that I couldn't have bought half of them ten times over for the money they've cost me. I must have said I would never believe it possible that anyone could go in the way I have week after week, month after month, without ever backing a winner. I don't understand it. Upon my soul, I don't. What enjoyment could you possibly get out of anything like that? None at all. It's been the most miserable two years of my life. Well, well what moved me to a pardon and direction, sir, is our room down the air that managed to save the book so smart that no one ever found out. Yes, how did you? We've always prided ourselves on our system of watching tight. Oh, that part was easy. As you can, I'm a ledger keeper in charge of the book with customers from A, H to K. One of the accounts in my ledger is Mr. Hudson, the soup gentleman who often flashes checks for large amounts. All I did was to open an account of my own so I could buy blank check forms and then forge Mr. Hudson's name and present the check for payment. Well, you can say cost, sir. Uh, the teller would enter the check in the journal and then pass both along to me for entering my ledger. I'd mark the journal as if the ledger had been posted, but I'd not make any entry in the ledger at all, and I'd destroy the check. You see, sir, it was quite simple. Well, surely the first time the ledger and journal were compared, the discrepancies were found out. Aye, but I was able to overcome that, sir, by a method I devised. It's a bit complicated to explain in detail, but if you'll give me leave, I'll get the book, sir, and I'll show you how it was done. They're just outside in the general office. Well, fetch them, fetch them by all means. Aye, sir, if you'll pardon me, I'll, I'll not be in there. I don't know whether you've understood all this talk about journals and ledgers and so on. Quite frankly, I haven't. But then I can't even understand my own income tax assessments. Well, I don't want to anyway. Anyhow, it doesn't matter very much, for by now you've suspected, as the manager and accountant obviously didn't, that Gowdy's purpose in leaving the room was not to bring back the books at all. Well, a minute passed, then a second, then a third, and finally the manager began to feel vaguely that everything wasn't as it should be. We sent the accountant out to look for Dowdy. The accountant, at any rate, was back promptly enough. Well, he's gone, sir. But gone? Yes, sir. Well, it's out of the office. Took his hat and coat and went to the front door as calm as he might. Well, why didn't something stop him? Aye, aye, aye. Was there not in some business means? Oh, well, I don't think you'll stand there getting like a fool, man. Do something. What was the general? Well, send someone after him at once and then get in touch with the police. Oh, oh, go on. oh never mind. I'll do it myself. As you can imagine, there was quite a hue and cry for young Mr. Thomas Peterson Gowdy, supervised by the Chief Commissioner of Police himself. The point of this bear in mind is that the fellow obviously has plenty of money. The last check he forged only ten days ago was for £31,000. He's bound to try to get out of England as quickly as possible, and he won't care what it costs. My guess is that he's probably bribed the captain of some cargo ship and is well out at sea already. I'll remember him to do the best we can. Telegraph his description to all police stations. Ask for a careful watch to be kept at all day without machines and walls. Have ship's passenger list checked and the captain of every ship in every port interviewed. If only those people at the bank hadn't let him slip so stupidly through their fingers, we wouldn't have had to do all this. Let me know as soon as anything happens. <laughs> 
As it turned out, the commissioner was a shade optimistic. For whatever had become of the 31,000 pounds, Dowdy certainly didn't have it. A few days later, in a village not very far from Liverpool, an innkeeper found himself involved with trouble with one of his guests. Just a minute, if you don't mind, Mr. McBain. Where do you think you're going with that portmanteau? Why, I'm, uh, I'm leaving. I told you I'd be off today. Eh? So you thought you could just walk out on me, eh? What about my money? That's 37 shillings you owe me. Aye, of course. I'll write you a check. No checks, thanks. Uh, I'll have cash if you don't mind. I might have ready cash just now, but if you wait till I go to the... Oh, no, you don't. I've been bit that way before. I want your cash, Mr. McBain, and I want it now. But until you have not got it... In that case, I'll keep your bag till you find it. Come on, give it here. What do you think you're doing? That's mine. Let go of it. I want my money. Give me my bag. Now, now come on, then. Now, then. What's going on here? Well, uh, this man's trying to get away without paying board. That's not true, Constable. He's trying to steal my clothes. I'm holding him for security. I offer to... Pay. Oh, no, you didn't. I need that's that. enough. Who are you? Haven't I seen you before? Well, you may have done. I've been in the village a few days. What's your name? Dennis McBain. Are you quite sure of that? Are you quite sure it's not uh, Thomas and Peterson Gowdy? Of course I'm sure. Who's he? I've never heard of him. You answer his description well enough. I tell him my name's McBain. Oh, perhaps so, and perhaps not. I'd better take you to the station, I think, to have a talk to Sergeant. And I'd not try any funny business about his humor, lad. I was North Country wrestling champion, catch us catch can not so long ago. Go on along with you now. Gowdy did the best he could, of course. He persisted in an indignant denial of his identity, and he was still persisting and threatening all sorts of legal action when they returned him to Liverpool in custody. There in his cell, he was identified by the manager of the bank, and when that gentleman had gone... Well, young man... You still deny you are Thomas Gowdy? Well, it doesn't seem to be much point about it now, does it? None at all. All right. I admit it, then. And that's been much more sensible, I must say. You know, Gowdy, we policemen aren't such bad fellows. We can help you a lot, if you're prepared to help us. What is it you want me to do? About all this money. Would you care to come into my office and make a statement? Well, I might as well, I suppose, but I don't suppose you'll ever believe me. Oh, I wouldn't mind having a bet on that. As you've gathered by now, Thomas Gowdy was not a young man to do anything by half measures. When he'd embarked on his career of embezzlement, He'd made a thorough job of it. After all, 160,000 pounds is hardly a sum to be sneezed at. And now that he decided to confess, he made a thorough job of that too. It was an incredible story, he told. So incredible that for a while the police commissioner must have found it difficult to believe. Except, of course, that no one could have invented anything quite so fantastic. Well, it had all begun about three years ago. So Gowdy's statement went. He was in a bar and a pub not very far from the bank, having a sandwich and a pint of mild and bitter for lunch when he got into casual conversation with a man standing next to him. A well-dressed, well-spoken, very pleasant sort of man. Oh, the weather we're having for this time of the year. Aye, it is that. Seems almost a crime to waste time indoors. One should be out in the sunshine. As a matter of fact, I think I'll treat myself to an afternoon at the races. Oh, are they having races today? Yes, didn't you know? Well, didn't I take much interest in racing? You should. It's a fine sport. And it can be very profitable, too. I don't suppose you'd like to take pity on a lonely Londoner and come out with me. Yeah, as my guest, of course. Well, I couldn't do that. I have to go back at the bank in ten minutes. Oh, I work in a bank. Yeah. I have a bank in Liverpool. Indeed. A splendid institution, I'm told. Well, I have had it said they're trifle immediately in the salaries they pay. Well, they aren't exactly generous. What do you give a young man like yourself if it's not a real question? Ten pounds a year? Divide that by four and you'd be nearer the mark. What? Well, it's absurd. Unskilled labor is almost as much these days. I wonder you stick it. A job's a job. Quite so, but there's no need to make yourself a slave to it. 
There are other ways of making money and working for it. Take myself, for instance. I often earn as much in an afternoon as you do in a whole year. You do? Yes. Betting on racehorses, you mean? No. I've always been told racing was a game for fools. So it is, unless you know the right people. Well, this afternoon, for example, there's a man running on the 230 that can't possibly be beaten. In fact, I happen to know it's uh, all arranged for her to win. You mean arranged in advance? Precisely. Well, these things are quite often, you know. So what shall I do? I shall go after the course, I shall wager a modest 50 pounds at two to one, and I shall come home this evening 150 to the good. Quite a pleasant and remunerative day's work, eh? Are you very pleasant? Yes. What a shame you can't come with me. I don't imagine you'd object to picking up a little easy money on the side any more than most of us. Still, duty calls, I suppose. I'm afraid it does. Oh, so well, some other time, perhaps. Oh, uh, look here, sir. Uh, Kelly, give me the name. Oh, look here, Mr. Kelly. I suppose if I were to, well, to give you a couple of pounds, could you take it out and get it for me? Well, yes, yes, of course. It wouldn't be asking too great a favour. Not at all. Well, if, if you're quite sure, then, here's the money. <laughs> oh, I see. But you're, you're very trusty, aren't you? I mean, after all, I'm a complete stranger. Now, how do you know I shan't just disappear with your money and not turn up again? I can tell an honest man when I see one. I'd have not suggested such a thing if I had any doubt about you. That's all the kind of you, old man. You want to come by, I shan't let you down. Let's have another drink, shall we? No, 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 please. No, this is my privilege, I says. Yes, of course, the same old story. It's happened a thousand times, and it's amazing how little the technique changed with the years. No doubt, Dowdy was gullible. That aren't we all at one time or another? By some mischance, the mayor didn't win the 2.30 after all. And when the obliging Mr. Kelly turned up that evening, he brought no winnings, only a sad account of a plunge that had gone astray. Gowdy regarded the loss of his two pounds with no little gloom. But Kelly, who'd lost considerably more, or so he said, refused to be in the least downhearted. Cheer up, old man. We'll get it all back tomorrow with compound interest. Tomorrow? You know the old saying, first you won't succeed and all that. In fact, there's a horse called Flyway Paul entered for three o'clock. Well, I'm not quite sure it's all fixed yet, my little woman, but I'll arrange to meet the trainer here. Remember the name of Styles, a rough diamond, rather, well, but you'll like him, sure. He's promised to let me know. Oh, he's not. Evening, Styles. Oh, my lady, Mr. Kelly. Uh, Styles? I'd like to meet Mr. Gowdy. Oh, no, no, pleased to meet you, sir, I'm sure. How do you do? Uh, Begging your pardon, Mr. Kelly, but uh, I've only a minute to spare, so uh, if you make it up a little uh, word in private, as you might say. You can speak quite openly before Mr. Gowdy. Is he now friends? Yeah. Oh, oh, well, uh, uh, well, that being the case, sir, uh, it's all set, and mum's the word. Ah, uh, there's no doubt in the room? Yeah, he'd have to fall over and break his neck for him to take it off in this. Um, Styles, here's a ten pound note for your trouble. Oh, uh, much obliged, sure, I'm sure, sir. And uh, next time you've got any information, don't forget to let me know. No, I'm always happy to do business with a jet like yourself. Good evening, Styles. Well, old man, you see how simple it is. Of course, Flyway Paul is sure to be at a short price, no more than two to one, I should think. But there's no old racing maxim with all the odds about a winner, but good odds. Now, I suggest you let me have a fiver. That means you'll clear today's loss and be eight pounds to the good. Five pounds is a lot of money to risk on a racehorse. Nonsense, where's the risk? Anyhow, if you don't speculate, you won't accumulate, you know. I'm afraid I've not got five pounds with me at the moment. Well, that's all right. You can let me have it tomorrow at lunchtime. In fact, if it's going to inconvenience you to get the money, I could stake it to you as a loan. Just between the friends, you understand? That's very kind of you, but I'll have it with me. And so the lamb was led to the slaughter. It was amazing how many of Kelly's hot tips didn't win. And even more amazing how quickly and how heavily Gowdy found himself in debt. Kelly was quite decent about it, of course, but after a while, quite understandably, he began to hint that he'd like his money. And if it wasn't forthcoming, he might be obliged to go to the bank and lay a complaint. Gowdy knew that would mean dismissal, so in desperation, he forged his first check. And when that wasn't found out, he forged another, and another. Not that the money ever did him any good. On the contrary... It went straight into the rapacious and apparently bottomless pockets of Messrs. Kelly and Stiles. It didn't take this pair long to realize how God they must be obtaining these very welcome them, and this knowledge gave them an extra and powerful hold over him. In fact, within a few minutes, they so showed themselves that they didn't feel the need to pretend any longer. I've good news, Gary. 
I've decided we shall have 200 pounds on Grey Seal tomorrow afternoon. 200 pounds? On second thought, we'll make it three. You can't bet away Grey Seal's got no chance of winning. But don't say that, old man. Miracles do happen sometimes. They're miracles. I do when I'd no see the money. Of course you wouldn't. In other words, this is blackmail, nothing else. Here, here, that's no joke. Nelson Styles. Of course it's blackmail. And very nice blackmail, too, I must say. Well, you've got me just where you want me, don't you? Haven't we? Suppose I refuse to let you have any more money. Oh, always I'm discussing such a great possibility. Don't you imagine I'm going to lay my hands on 300 pounds? In the same place you let your hands rest, I do. Remember, think of me, that's what you've done. Supposing I'm found out. Well, that'd be rather bad luck for you, wouldn't it? Suppose we stop being dirty. We want that money. Have it here at noon tomorrow. And if you let us know, well, we don't know what to expect. The more Dolly paid them, the greater became their demands. And the checks he was forced to forward became larger and more frequent. Till in some time of three years, they'd been of no less than £70,000. How such wholesale robbery could go on for so long without being discovered at bank, is one of those mysteries that I, for one, shall never understand. And what Gowdy must have felt, being triple agony of London, since utter helplessness, is hard to imagine. Obviously, there had to be a breaking point somewhere. But when it did come, ultimately, it was from an unexpected source. This sudden and overwhelming action of the Parkellian Styles hadn't gone unnoticed among their own fraternity, and three gentlemen of the turf, by names Burge, Mances, and Marx, set out to discover where it was coming from. Marx was in and been to the show, and the tactics he used were of the good old-fashioned and usually effective variety. Well, we'll pour another drink, Mr. Styles. Ah, uh, that's very cold of you, Mr. Marx. Hey, Conji. Oh, oh, boy. Oh, it was a pleasure to drink with a pal. Ah. Yeah, there you are. Yeah, much obliged, I'm sure. You're a gentleman. That's what I've always said. Say what you like, Mr. Marx. is a gentleman. I've always said. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cheers, old boy. Cheers. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. You know something? You know something, Mr. Marks? Uh, what? Now, I'm for you, Mr. Oh, no, 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 this is my part. Then you keep your money. Well, money, money, plenty more will they skip and play. Which is rolling in money, Mr. Kelly, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Shall I tell you something? We stick a gold mine, we have. A regular bloody gold mine. You interest me enormously. Still go on. <laughs> and, of course, Styles did go on and on until the whole story had been revealed. I know that Marks was a man of quite commendable enterprise. He knew that the time to strike was when the iron was hot. And so on the following day, October the 18th, 1901, if you must be exact, Thomas Peterson Gowdy has a visitor, who had a proposition to perform that was simply itself. Mr. Burge and Mr. Mances and myself are in partnership as turf kitchen agents, Mr. Gowdy. Our card. You've been recommended to us as a very generous better. Have we decided that you shall transfer your custom to us? You are waiting for the more. We decided that tomorrow after you are going to invest five thousand pounds on Princess Kitty. Cash, of course. Small notes for friends. And I can't be talking about. I think we understand each other quite well, Mr. Gardy. If you could let us have the money by noon tomorrow, it'd suit admirably. Oh, uh, and I wouldn't mention this to Mr. Kelly or Mr. Styles if I were you. And my lesson is done. Well, that's your game, eh? Exactly. I'll not do it. I've been bred enough as it is. Oh, can't damn Mr. Gardy. Why make such a fuss over such a small sum? You call five thousand pounds small? A mere bag of hell. Surely for a noble old resources in the Bank of Liverpool behind him? I met your general manager once, a charming fellow. I not intended to call on him again and say, how do you do? I've some free time tomorrow morning. Do you fly? All right. What? You'll get your money. That's very sensible of you, Mr. Gardy. I'll see you at noon. Good night. It was all much too easy. Burge, Mances, and Marx followed up their first demand for 5,000 pounds, segment nine. Gowdy protested that they... The next day they demanded 16,000, no less than 30,000, and a week after that, 31,000. Gowdy forged and cashed all checks and handed over money. 91,000 pounds within three weeks. Incredible? That's what I should have told, but it actually happened. Well, that was the story Thomas Gowdy told the police commissioner. And the commissioner got no time going to work. Kelly, Styles, and Burge were quickly run to earth, but Nancy's and Marks got cleared away for the best part of fifty thousand pounds. They were not found then, and they never have been to this day. But for Gowdy, the ordeal was not by any means over. Now, Daddy, I presume you want to make things as light to yourself as possible, don't you? I don't care much what Mr. Marks. 
I'll put it to you this way, then. You want to see justice done as far as possible, don't you? Yes, I do. That's the way to talk. I've discussed this case with Mr. Charles Gill, who will be prosecuting. And I understand that you'll face a number of individual charges, also several jointly with Killian Styles, and so others that they urge. Now, what Mr. Gill suggests is this. If you plead guilty to the charges against yourself, and let us plead not guilty, you will then become available to give evidence against them. Will you do that? Wouldn't that I acting on the door? Nonsense, man. What have they ever done for you except lead you deeper and deeper into the mire? You've never got yourself into this mess at all, if it hadn't been for them. That's so, isn't it? Aye, that's true enough. Very well, then. What do you say? I'll do you the sir. Thanks to Gowdy's evidence and the way he stood up for the grueling cross-examination, the charges against Kelly, Stiles, and Burge were fully proven, and they were found guilty and sent to jail for long periods. As for such guns, were carried by one of the ablest men in the country, Frederick Edwin Smith, first Earl of Birkenhead, had come back into Irving, but even his eloquent plea that his client's crimes were committed under compulsion, the natural foreclosure carried little weight, and Gowdy was sentenced to ten years' penal servitude. He died in jail. Perhaps the only crime in history to have embezzled 160,000 pounds without gaining any financial benefit for himself. He lost his job. He lost his money. He lost his health. He died in jail. The perfect. I'll be back again soon to tell you some more of the secrets of Scotland Yard. Meanwhile, this is Clive Brooks saying goodbye and pleasant